Welcome back, everyone, to the Disaster Tough Podcast, where we share insights into the big plays and right calls of leadership. We dive deep into the stories, lessons learned, and ideas that will help you in the field. Let's go. Welcome back to the Disaster Tough Podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this week's episode. I think I think every week I get excited. However, my COO, Denny Adams, she's also over the moon. I've heard about Kim Campbell, Casey, literally every single day. She was so excited when she decided to come on here. And for great reason. She has over 100 combat missions. She was a fighter pilot. KC was her call sign. She has a book, Flying in the Face of Fear. We can talk about that a little bit. But she goes around and talking about leadership and building teams and doing the right thing and overcoming fear and all that stuff. Um, she is just absolutely incredible. You're going to hear about her in a little bit. But you know, with this perspective, as you come into this podcast episode and you're thinking, okay, how does a fighter pilot apply to me as an emergency man- manager? Or how does a fighter pilot apply to me if I was a fire chief or a police chief? We all have different experiences in our career where we have to step up. And she has definitely stepped up quite a bit. And so as you listen to her experiences, try to apply that to you and see what you can gain from it. But with that, Casey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't have the opportunity very often to call people by their call sign. So I feel really special doing that. Thank you for allowing me to do that. But (laughs) you have uh, quite the resume. I don't know if I can do it justice. Just for the audience sake, can you share, I mean, maybe a 10th because there's so much back there. Can you share a little bit about your background? Yeah, I, uh, I spent 24 years in the Air Force. I spent most of that time as a fighter pilot, uh, specifically an A-10 pilot. Our mission was to, was to uh, support troops on the ground. Uh, as you mentioned, I flew uh, over 100 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, dating back to kind of the 2002 and on time frame. Uh, I got to fly about 1,800 hours in the A-10, uh, worked my way up as a wingman, and then on to as a, a flight lead and an instructor in the airplane, and then spent the rest of my career while I was still flying uh, in leadership roles as well. So squadron commander, about 150 people, group commander, about 1,000 people throughout South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, I got an opportunity to... Uh, life came full circle a little bit, go back to the Air Force Academy where my career began and finished out my career there teaching and then as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. Um, But a great way to close out my career, kind of focusing on the next generation of aviators, of leaders. Uh, And now I am a keynote speaker, I'm an author and really just enjoying this next chapter of my life. I have two boys who are 11 and 15 and they, uh, they keep me grounded uh, in many ways. Yeah, good fun. Uh, yeah. Enjoying this kind of next chapter and focusing on leadership development. That's awesome. My kids are five, three, and one on the way, so I'm a little bit, uh, you know, behind you on that one. Uh, being a dad is like the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I I've done a lot of cool things from the disaster world spot, but I, I take dad over any of that any day. So. Uh, I think that's awesome that you called that out and specifically for all the incredible accomplishments you have adding mom to that um, big hats off to you for, for calling that out there for somebody who has done already so many things. I, I kind of, I asked you about this a little bit before, right before we start recording about, I wouldn't say the adrenaline rush, but the professionalism, the thing that you get from it, from going out, you know, whether it's combat missions or training other people or being up in the sky, whatever it may be. How have you transitioned from a role like that into a new role? We have, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a reason why I'm asking. We have a lot of people who will do a tactical job, i.e. fire police, EMS, and they get to help out. And then they transition over to a leadership role where they're not on scene anymore. And sometimes there's a struggle there. How, how have you dealt with that as, as you've moved through all these different cool things you've done? It's such a great question. I think, you know, I think now kind of in this next chapter of my life, I think the thing that I miss the most is the camaraderie, right? And that very specific purpose and passion for what we do. Um, that is always a hard transition to to move on to something else, but it's also finding it in a new way. Mm-hmm. Um, but to answer the second, really the second part of that question is how did I go from being this, you know, tactical fighter pilot, and then you move up the ranks. And uh, I will, I will say like, 
I was at the peak of my flying career, right? As a young mm-hmm. captain. So just kind of starting off, you know, hours in the airplane, like very, very good at what I was doing. And then all of a sudden you're put in these leadership roles. You're not quite a, quite hanging out as much mm-hmm. in the, in the vault and studying. And, you know, you're just, I, it was, a, it's a little bit of a transition of like, you don't want to lose your game. You still want to be totally credible and capable. Mm-hmm. Now you have all this added responsibility. Um, and it's pressure in a new way, you know, to lead, set the example. Um, and that still requires credibility and capability. Um, and it just, for me, it was something that it evolved over time, you know, as I increased in leadership roles, trying to kind of find my way and knowing that I probably wasn't as good as I was when I was that young captain, you know, especially as a Colonel, um, you know, and it's just, again, it's, I think there's something important about when you're a leader being humble and approachable, uh, mm-hmm. as well as that credible piece. And so just knowing that some of the young people, they are the best in the airplane. They are the best at the tactics. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are the best at kind of the threats and and being willing to learn from them. I mean, that's really just what I took all the way through is never stop learning, especially learn from the members of your team. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue, and collapsed and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. Cyberne Convergence, the world's largest conference for the non-conventional threat, is heading back to Orlando between October 28th and 30th, 2024. With three days of workshops, lectures, and interactive sessions delivered by speakers from around the world on the latest issues and approaches to Cyberne and Hazmat. Make sure to claim your early bird discount by registering now at seaburneyworld.com slash event slash Orlando. Okay, first of all, that's super humble of you to say that. So I, I don't know if I believe you because I... I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess you've always been at like the forefront of everything. When you like walk into a room, everybody like pays attention. So, uh, I bet that is uh, very humble uh, the way you're saying that. I, I will say for me, going from uh, getting the call and going out to a wildfire, going out to a hurricane again, not fighter pilot, but for me in my world, hey, that's pretty exciting and fun. I want to be a part of that and uh, that level of professionalism. Um, when I started the business, you know, four or five years ago, it took me like years before I stopped saying, Hey, I'm an emergency manager. People are like, what are you, do- what do you do for your job? Oh, I'm an emergency manager. Cause like I associated that so much with my personality, but that's not really the the scope of the job anymore. I had to learn new skills and let, I want to say, let some of those go, but uh, uh, the personality shift, uh, was difficult. Funny enough, uh, you mentioned the camaraderie. Every military person I've had on the podcast has said that one way or the other. They all miss that that moment. I'm surprised that the authors don't get into a room and there's not a whole bunch of camaraderie. But um, how do you how do you like now move forward? Now that you are in these roles, you, you talked about hey, finding excitement in, in other ways now. Um, from a leadership standpoint and having to step into those roles and taking on some of that humility that comes with learning a new skill set, whatever it may be, you you still have to scratch the itch though somehow, right? Like you still have to, I, I, I have to find ways to find joy. How do you do that? Yeah, I, I think that's so true. You need to find ways to find that joy, to find those things that really add value. And you know, for me, part of it is um, getting involved with charitable organizations. You know, I spent my entire career as a pilot who supported troops on the ground. Hmm. That was a huge part of my life. It was like this passion that I had. And so when that stopped, when I stopped flying, there was like this part of me that felt like, you know, it stopped. Like it was Hmm. like, how do I get that feel back? And For me, I uh, joined the board for the Special Operators Transition Foundation. And the whole idea is that now we are helping these special operators transition from the military to the civilian world Mm -hmm. and find a new career and find a new path. So 
now I'm still helping support our troops on the ground just in a different way. So it's it's finding things like that, you know, that bring me passion, that bring me joy, that feel like I can fulfill that piece of me that quite honestly felt like it was missing for a little while. Um, no. You know, can I ever replace flying an A-10? No. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's something about flying that airplane that's just pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, I still get my adrenaline rush at mountain biking, hiking, skiing, mm. you name it. So That's awesome. uh, it's finding passion and purpose just sometimes in a new way. So let's talk about the new, one of the new ways that you've done flying in the face of fear. I understand um, that you're this author and you've done this amazing stuff and you're talking, I actually watched a video to you, you, you addressing fear specifically. Can you talk about kind of what the book's about and why you specifically wrote it about that? Yeah, you know, um, I think throughout my career, um, I think back so many times in different moments um, where I felt fear and one didn't want to admit it. Um, but it was usually like fear accompanied with something else like nervousness mm -hmm. or excitement, whether it was starting basic training, you know, just the excitement of finally going to do what I wanted to do, but also being really nervous, right? I don't want to screw mm -hmm. this up. I want to be able to perform it was walking into my fighter squadron on day one, like this young new pilot that was going to be the only woman in the squadron. Mm. You know, there was a lot of pressure that I put on myself, but I was still really excited, but there was still this fear of like, well, to be honest, fear of failure, right? Fear, fear of not meeting expectations. It was taking on a new leadership role, having this fear that, you know, I did want to live up to expectations. I wanted to live up to my own expectations. And, uh, you know, so excitement and nervous at the same time. It was, you know, my husband left for a one year deployment to Afghanistan. It was the fear of like, can I do this on my own? So I just, mm -hmm. I say all those things because I think we do face fear in our everyday life. It doesn't always have to be life or death. Certainly a lot of your listeners and a lot of the people listening in, it is life or death, but it, it can be fear of, failure of change of the unknown of all of these things. The reality is that we face that fear. It is all about what we do with it that matters. Like mm. it's just, it's normalizing the fear and then just focusing on, okay, you feel that way. Now it's time to step up and take action. And so that's what the book is about. That's incredible. Uh, the, as you, as you're talking about that, it reminded me of a story that, um, Margaret Larson shared with us. She is a medevac pilot for special forces a good friend of mine that I went to Georgetown with. And so shout out to her. But um, she was talking about all the different ways that you experience fear and anxiety and how you overcome it. Um, she's doing awesome stuff now um, in the private sector with a, a nonprofit. Funny enough that you brought up the nonprofit thing as well. So there's a lot of um, overlap there. But um, I, how do I ask this in a polite way to everybody's listening? For somebody who has dealt with life and death situation, who's dealt with combat missions, is it when you see people struggling with the everyday stuff, is it hard for you to say something like, oh, I, I recognize that that could be difficult for you? Uh, and I'll, I'll do it for my, me. Like once I, once I, uh, dealt with the people who had died in a wildfire, specifically a wildfire. It was really hard for me for a long time to have compassion over the everyday uh, difficulties. And I had to find a way to be compassionate again, like, oh, you stubbed your toe for you. I recognize that that's a big deal. How do you deal with that? That's a great question. And I think I've gotten better at it over time, right? I think initially coming home from Iraq back in 2003, kind of facing my own life or death moment, uh, it definitely put life into perspective from, um, you know, what's really important. Like, what should we really be worried about? What should we really be focusing on? Which was a great conversation that I had with my husband at very early in our marriage as well. Mm. Um, but I also, like you said, there was a little bit of like, there's a war going on. There's people are dying. We've lost friends. You know, we've lost, you know, troops on the ground. Like, how are we focusing on some of these things that are so important? And I honestly, I was, I felt angry for a while. I was just like, how is the rest of the world, the rest of the people in the United States, how are we not more aware and fo following what's going on? And, you know, I just, and I think over time, it's just an understanding that 
when you're not in it, sometimes you don't see it and you don't feel it in the same way. Um, and I, I just kind of had to come to grips with that, that those of us that are in it in the moment, like we're very close to it, you know, and in some ways I don't want other people to have to feel that. So there's that side of it as well. But I think also, you know, as time has passed, I also recognize that, you know, I have felt fear and doubt and worry, especially in leadership positions. And is it the same as a life or death situation? I don't know. Fear is generally fear, right? And so to me, it's all about like, however you feel is how you feel, but what you do with it is what matters. And so it's the you know, pushing ourselves outside our comfort zone, outside of what we feel like we can, you know, sometimes that we're the doubt that we have that we can actually go do it, right? That we're capable of doing it. And to me, that's what I focus on. I don't really, I'm not there to judge how anybody else feels, whether they feel doubt or worry or nervous. I just, my goal is like, how do I help you move beyond that? When you um, hear about a challenge, are you the type of person who, um, like wants that challenge if somebody says you can't do something does that make you want to do it even more like if you were indifferent before are you now not indifferent uh i definitely am all about a good challenge yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know that. it's the funny the way you ask that because um i had the only thing i wanted to do as a as a middle school high school like my only goal in life was to go to the air force academy uh, it was the, it was like my goal. I was going to the air force Academy. I was going to, going to become a fighter pilot. And so I put everything I could into that, right. I worked hard. I studied, I just played sports. I had all these extracurricular activities. And then one day my senior year, about April timeframe, I opened the mailbox and I get this letter and, uh, it had the air force blue stationary, you know, super excited. Is a thin letter though. I should have known better. And it said, you know, thanks for applying, but essentially you're not good enough. Try again next oh, year. Man. You know, it was a rejection letter hmm. and, um, it was devastating. I, I mean, I won't lie that I was totally devastated and upset. And thankfully I had these mentors and coaches and parents that were like, Hey, if this is your goal, don't quit. Um, and so I decided I would write the Air Force Academy a letter every week and let them know, hey, I could I could do 10 more push-ups or 10 more pull-ups, like whatever it is, you know, I'd let them know and I still want to go. If somebody turns it turns down their spot, like count me in. Um, I eventually got an acceptance letter right before basic training started. But I'll tell you what, that no, that rejection was like a little fire for me. It was like, all right, you told me no. Well, now I'm gonna go show you that that I belong here, you know, not just belong, but I am going to excel. And I would end up going on to lead the cadet wing. So all 4,000 cadets, I graduated at the top of my class and number one in military order of merit. I, I don't know would I have done as well if somebody hadn't told me no, and like proposed that challenge maybe, but it sure did light a fire for me. So there is something about, you know, somebody challenging me on something that I can't do or I shouldn't do, or maybe they don't think I'm good enough to do. I do have a little bit of like, okay, that's fine. Glad yeah. you said that way. I'm going to show yeah, like, you all otherwise. Yeah, freaking Barbara Walter saying your name, you know, I saw that on the clip. It's it. The reason why I asked that is because, um, the, the, the few people I've met who have done absolutely incredible things like yourself, there's, there's something inside of them that I find is fascinating. I would hope that I have that a little bit too, but um, the the ability to do hard things often is associated with um, people who are are unyielding when somebody tells them no, and or it, it, that can translate to the situation as well, right? The people that I find um, my friends who maybe struggle during hard moments it's because they naturally recoil when things get hard. And I find it fascinating to, to ask people like yourself who are like, no, how, how dare you? I'm going to, not only did you get in, but you became number one. Of course you became number one, right? Like uh, you're, you're not a person that I would, uh, I think it'd be wise. I don't think it'd be wise to dismiss you because I think you're going to show up. And that's pretty cool to, to, to be able to hear your perspective on that. Your motivations, I'm sure there's lots of different things that motivate you 
from a leadership standpoint, especially as you transition out and you're and you're looking at these things and you're you're flying in the face of fear, as you've talked about. Um, how do you? What advice would you give to people who uh, need that sense of motivation, especially as they're seeking to motivate others? Well, I think a lot of it for me, you know, my personal kind of motivation is based on service to others, and I think. Mm -hmm you know, that is part of being a leader. It's service to others. And it, it, when, if we can explain our why, right, the why behind something, um, I think that helps other people with the, their motivation for things. So, you know, as a leader, when I would be out at different units visiting my, my young airmen, you know, yeah, I, it's the military. I get it. I can just tell everybody what to do, right? That authoritarian way. Eh, that doesn't really work all that great. Um, you know, there are moments where it might need to in a chaotic situation, but I think if you can build trust, you can build connection, you can build buy-in by starting with why, right? Simon Sinek, great book. Um, but start with why, explain the why behind things. I think that goes a long way to just helping people, especially at lower levels of an organization that don't always get to hear it. You know, explaining that down to our, you know, our youngest soldier, our youngest airman, our youngest firefighter, whatever it is, you know, just talking through the why behind decisions, thinking, I get it. We don't always have the time to do that, but when we can make the time, when we can create those connections, really build that rapport with our team, I think that goes a long way. That goes a long way into just creating kind of a common purpose, a common connection, you know, that common sense of service to something else, something bigger and more important than just ourselves. I love that the fact that you quoted Simon Sinek. I love starting with why. I think that's a uh, fantastic uh, approach. I think it's a wise approach to get people to be led by passion and by a sense of mission and a sense of servitude, uh, or at least serving others. The, um, the, one of the worst things I think I've heard a, either a leader or a parent say, uh, which is often said by both is, uh, do it because I said so. And, um, people miss an opportunity to learn. Now there are moments where if you're, if you have a leader and everybody has a leader that they have to pay attention to, sometimes you do just need to do the job. And there is that. Um, those who question every decision are not very helpful. However, there is a time and place. And even if you don't have the time or place right then to say, let me, let me walk you through this, there, there should be that moment. And um, if people can, I, I have found that most of the time, if you can walk people through your thought process of why you're doing A to Z, they're more likely to follow you anyways. And if you do that enough times, they will stop asking because they they have built that trust. Uh, I, I It drives me nuts when a leader says, just do it because I said so and then just leaves. Like, Yeah, do like, it because I said so or it's the way we've always done it. You know, two oh, things that that, drive that's me one, yeah. crazy. You know, it's in, what you said though. I mean, the, the whole point is, right? We build this trust. We build this connection, as, especially if we're talking about, you know, emergencies, chaos, crisis, so that when that chaos, when the crisis, when the emergency happens and we have to say, go do this, the trust is built, right? We've built the connection. We've built the trust. We know each other. We know how we perform. We've, we've built these relationships. And so that in that moment when nothing is going right, you know, everything is, is going wrong, we trust each other. We built the, we built that connection. And that to me is so important for leaders is to take the time to do that. Get out from behind your desk, you know, go walk around, go see how people are doing, really talk to people, find out where they struggle. What can you do to help? You know, it's, it's building that really solid foundation of trust so that when you have to go do hard things, you're ready to go do hard things because you've got the trust built in. So in in that vein, if you're building trust and you're you're working through your teams and you're overcoming fear and you're overcoming uh, maybe different types of motivations and trying to figure out how how people are motivated in that, whatever that motivation may be, for you, um, this is like the most Q and A podcast I've ever done because I'm so interested. By the way, uh, but that's fine for for you and and the way you operate right with your teams or whether you were training. What are some of those most effective tools that you found that get people to take their job to the next level? We, we talk about trust as a general sense, but what can we we do as a field to get people to really step up? 
Well, I think that one of the, one of the things that we do in the fighter pilot community, I think we do it very well is we, we always do a debrief. We mm. always do a debrief. So mission success doesn't matter. Mm. We do a debrief, uh, you know, combat, we do a debrief. Um, and so there is something to be said about, you can go out and do a job very well. You still need to do a debrief to figure out what went well, why, and how you will continue to repeat that. Mm. Um, but I think a debrief is essential. I think having a debrief where you talk about your objectives, um, you talk about which ones went well and which ones did not go so well. Um, mm. and you really drill down into the mistakes that you made. Um, I think sometimes we take an easy way out with mistakes. It's easy to blame somebody. Um, but really it's, it's asking the question, why, why did that mistake happen? What was the root cause of that mistake? Hmm. What was the root cause? What lesson did we learn? And then what are we going to do differently the next time? Um, and I think that debrief is absolutely critical, whether you have a success or where you have a failure, it's the after action report. It's the post team huddle. Even if you, all you have is five minutes, then take the five minutes. The key is a lot of times what I see is, you know, say it's an exercise or something like that. Well, you know, turns out next year, we tend to repeat the same mistakes unless we pull that after action off the shelf, dust it off, you know, whatever it is, revisit those lessons learned so that we don't continue to repeat them. Um, and I think that goes a long way to elevating performance. The caveat here is that that debrief will only work if you have that environment of trust, right? Where people feel safe to provide feedback, to admit mistakes without blame and without shame. So you got to build that trust. You got to build those connections, have that safe space, if you will, where people can provide feedback, where we can be brutally honest with each other so that we can elevate performance. Hey, we just want to do a quick pause X to thank all of our sponsors with the Readiness Lab Podcast Network, L3 Harris, Forerunner, C Bernie World, HQE Systems, Ampapar Response Training Center, Impulse, Doberman Emergency Management, and especially all of you who subscribe to the TRL Insider Program and who are listening to this episode right now. Thank you so much for your support. Let's jump back in. You remind me of a story. Um, we had just gotten back from a disaster and um, we had, uh, what's well, one way to say it? We had an, a, a new leader as part of our group. And um, he, he went into this whole spiel about in this after action, we'll talk about what happened, but we're, today we don't want to talk about solutions. That'll be another day. And uh, I've always been an outspoken person. So I you know, raise my hand and say, that's one of the dumbest ideas I've ever heard. <laughs> so like, why aren't we talking about solutions? Cause that's, that's the only thing I actually like really care about. Like, right. Like we can all talk about like the event, but if you don't get into like the why and overcoming the why the, the other issue I I've seen in the past, and I, I think I've been guilty of this myself and had to address it is uh, trying to figure out the difference between the root cause and the symptom. Sometimes we get so caught up in the symptom of this happened and this happened and this happened, but we don't get to, you know, the causality of why that happened. We talk a lot about the cascading impacts um, and, and we need to get to that in, in my world, in terms of, you know, the emergency side of things, I, I would say 90% of the time we talk about symptom and not about causality. And every time we talk about causality, the ideas, unfortunately, are so far beyond or so far be behind the curveball that they talk about things like well maybe i won't give an example because i don't want to embarrass anybody but the ideas just are not based off of data um, my brother-in-law a big shout out to john he's a pilot himself and um he talks him and my father-in-law uh both are, are, are both in, in that world they talk about in in the pilot world uh nearly a hundred percent. So 99.9% .9 of the time, if there's an issue with the plane, it's a uh, pilot error, it's human error. And, uh, they talk about that. And so, um, just curious on, on your world and thinking about that specifically overcoming human error, what is the best ways to address human error? And was, what are the, the, some of the worst ways to address human error? Like, how do we actually deal with this problem? So first I'll say, you know, it, you know, human error, right? We hear it all the time, pilot error, it's probably the leading cause and, uh, you know, of, um, of emergencies and fatalities and when things go wrong. Um, 
And that's hard, right? Because now you're potentially putting blame on somebody. I think mm. one of the things that we do is that we really try to focus on, all right, yes, that person may have done something wrong, but when, what can we learn from that? You know, what do, so that next time when this happens, and to me, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this idea of sharing those lessons and experiences, part of the reason I wrote the book. Um, I will tell you that um, after being hit with a surface to air missile over Baghdad, I'll make a long story short. Uh, please don't make that short. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's like the one story. Please don't make that one story short. What? You were so, hit by a service to air missile? Yes. Uh, so in back That's in 2003, uh, yeah, it wasn't really great. Uh, uh, back in 2003, while supporting ground troops, I was flying an A-10 over downtown Baghdad and, um, uh, we had done a few passes. We knew there were threats in the area, but uh, coming off my last rocket pass, I just felt and heard this loud explosion at the back of the airplane. And I knew immediately that I had been hit, right? I, it was no doubt in my mind. The jet nosed over, points down at Baghdad below. I kind of did the cursory pull back on the control stick and absolutely nothing happened. Uh, just completely now plunging to, to the ground out of control. I remember looking down at the ejection handles thinking, it's about the last thing I want to do, right, is potentially eject into the hands of the enemy. And so, yeah. um, you know, thankfully, kind of revert back to my training, right? All of my training kicks in in this one moment where it absolutely has to and was able to get the jet in our backup emergency system and, and get it climbing and away from Baghdad. But that trip home, right? So I survived the initial hit over Baghdad. I have a very battle, very heavily battle damaged airplane that's not flying spectacular. We'll put it that way. Uh, very difficult to fly home. But the thing that I remember on that way home, after being hit with a surface to air missile, after recovering a, a damaged airplane, was all the stories of the pilots that had came that had come before me that had been in a similar situation. So there were three pilots that had flown during Desert Storm who had been in this backup emergency system. It's called manual reversion. It's flying an airplane essentially on kind of the cranks and cables like old school flying without hydraulics. But I remembered their stories, right? I remembered the lessons learned. And even though those pilots weren't with me that day over Baghdad, their stories were, right? Those are the things that I remembered most. So yes, the first the first pilot that attempted to land in manual reversion, um, he was killed when he crashed on landing. It was really, was it his fault? Was it pilot error? Well, we didn't, there wasn't a lot that we, we didn't know about the system. And so yeah. he did what we always do on landing, which is we pull the power back. And unfortunately in this backup system, that did not go well but I knew that story. And so I, I knew that when it came time for me to try to land this airplane, that I was not going to do the same thing. You know, we, we learn from that. And so as hard as those things are, and, you know, just we lose people in this business and the idea is we learn from it every time. Like it's, it's something that we want to learn from and that every pilot along the way gets better. Um, so I, you know, I knew about these stories from the other pilots. I knew it because we talked about it in a bar on a Friday night. I knew about it because I read it in a book about, you know, eight, 10 pilots during desert storm. But if we don't share the stories and we, we don't share those lessons learned, even if they are human error, right. Even if it like to stand up in front of a room and say, I should have done this better, or I could have done this differently. Yeah, that sucks. That's embarrassing. And it's not, doesn't feel good. But if I can help somebody else, like that's got to be the motivation and the mindset is by sharing this, even if it's human error, I can help others on their journey. Because I know for me, the reason I was able to get that airplane back safely and land was because of the pilots that came before me. And I knew their stories. I knew their experiences. And it helped me get home safely. I, I know we're over time. Um but there's a famous picture of you in front of uh, your plane where it has bullet holes all going across. The this is a different experience from that. No, that was that mission that I, uh, okay. so the airplane was hit with the missile. Uh, it looks like bullet holes. It's actually shrapnel, shrapnel. from the, the missile when it impacted, sent shrapnel through the fuselage and tail section and my sadly gosh. damaging my flight control systems uh, in the process but good airplane you know built to take hits and it got me home safely good airplane great pilot that's what it sounds like i mean you remembered your training 
Uh, thank you for sharing that story with me. I, I feel embarrassed that I don't know about it because you, you do have so many great uh, things out there. But I do appreciate you sharing that story with me. Again, it goes back to that original comment and um, for, where you're talking about being angry when you came home in 2003. And it gives a little bit of light on that. Um, you know, for for everybody's listening in, we what I, I just call them dark nights where, you know, things didn't go to plan or whatever. Um, the way I look at mistakes, at, whether it's human error or mechanical error, whatever it may be, I am a big proponent of the belief on Murphy's law, like everything breaks. And it it is, it is much more important to me of how people react once a mistake has been made, whether it was an intentional mistake, like they did something stupid or things just happen. I, uh, maybe not service to air missile every day, but, um, the fact that you've responded and the way you've responded, this whole episode, you talk about responding to adversity in such a unique way. And, um, whether it was trying to get into the air force as a teenager or, uh, being hit by a service to air missile or dealing with leadership and, and those changes, it really just shows how incredible you are and your breadth of understanding and the ability for, for you to look at all sides of a problem. So thank you so much for coming on. Talk to me. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to, um, uh, wait, where do we find your book? Is it on Amazon? Where is it at? It is. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your favorite bookseller. It's flying in the face of fear of fighter pilots lessons on leading with courage. Perfect. And just for the audience sake, she didn't pay me to do that or anything, but we are going to put it in our show notes to make sure that, you know, we give you a big shout out. Hopefully everybody gets your book. Um, it is honestly a huge pleasure to, uh, and, and privilege to be able to talk to somebody like you and to hear your experiences and, um, you know, just pretty sweet to hear your call sign as well. So thanks, thanks again <laughs> for, for joining me on. But, thanks so much. All right, everybody. If you got something else that episode, which you should have, if you didn't, you're a loser. Uh, but you had to have gotten something else episode. I got lots of out of this episode. You got to give us that five star rating and subscribe. If you have a question for Kim specifically, you can reach out to us at contact at the readiness lab.com. We'll forward that on to her. Of course, we're going to put it on social media. So if you heard about something or if you want to thank her for everything she's done, go on social media when we post it and be like, hey, thanks or share your own lesson. I know we have a lot of people who are in the military who listen to our podcast as well. So uh, hopefully this helps you out in your job. And with that, we'll see you.